Welcome to Simply Caroline, a podcast dedicated to women empowerment where we will discuss a bunch of different subjects such as life, parenting, love, business, money, relationships, healing, recovery, addiction, entrepreneurship, and so much more. A podcast I'll do my best to keep simple, fun, and relatable and bring you tools to help you better your life. So thank you for being here. And here's your host, myself, Caroline Blanchard. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you for being with us today again. I have a very special guest, a lady who shared a book with me. We're both uh, co-authors in That Party Is Over, 12 Journeys to 12 Inspiring Journeys to Sobriety, Anna Majors. How are you, Anna? Hi, Caroline. I'm very good. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. I feel like a celebrity. Oh, <laughs> well, you are. No, um, yes, you are. We're all celebrities in our own way, you know, um, but I'm so honored to have you and uh, so happy and appreciative because I know that today we're going to talk about a subject that is not necessarily easy to talk about, but uh, you're a courageous person. You wrote about it in the book. And we're going to talk about it. And honestly, people, we are talking about that, not because we don't pretend to be experts. Uh, We're sharing our own stories, but we are sharing our stories, hoping it's going to help someone out there that, you know, a part of our story you will relate to. And like Anna and I were saying in the pre-interview, it's mostly to, you know, give hope. That's, I guess it's our whole mission, right? Yeah give hope. So uh, today we're talking about suicide awareness, mental health, and addiction. Um, And I will have you jump right in, Anna, and tell me a bit of your story. Okay, so I am 30 years old, soon to be 31. Um, I was originally... Yeah, thank you. It's either I get, you're still young, or wow, you're old. There's there's no in between. (laughs) Um, so I was originally born and raised in Seoul, South Korea. Uh, my mom is Korean. My dad is white American. And I flew to Boston, Massachusetts, which I, I'm here now. I came here for college and I, I got married here. So I ended up staying here. Um, but that's just a little bit about where I come from. I'm currently an events manager. I'm in marketing uh, I work at a startup that's in the behavioral health industry. Oh, so nice. that's a little bit about me. And then because of our topic is about addiction, um, I was definitely addicted to alcohol. That was my addiction. Um, started drinking when I was 14. And I quit the month before I turned 30. So I'm actually a little over 10 months sober now. Yay, congratulations. What's your date? It is March 22nd, 2022. Oh, so like in literally two and a half weeks, congratulations. Um, yeah, and, and just keep on going. So you say you started drinking at 14 and I think, you know, there's there's uh, different points in your story that I, that I want you to, uh, to, to talk about because first of all, you're half Korean mm-hmm. and for me, um for from what i know of that culture um it's a very healthy clean culture so how did it go for you i mean it's a healthy clean culture on the outside right image is very big in korea um so like if i were to dress in sweatpants and a hoodie to go to the grocery store i would kind of be looked at funny um, like I, I, you're a mom, so school pickup lines, I know mothers like to go very comfortably in Korea, like you want to dress up to impress the others. So image is big, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily clean. Uh, drinking culture is huge in Korea, like one of those countries where alcohol is cheaper than water. Wow. Isn't that yeah. crazy? It's crazy. Yeah. It was like, we don't know this reality here in North America, but mm-hmm keep going (laughs) yeah and I honestly think like 
it made it very easy for me to start drinking because I was in Korea. First of all, the drinking age is younger. Uh, you can pretty much drink right up right out of high school. Which is what, 16? 18, 19. Okay. Um, in Quebec too here, it's 18, by the way. Mm -hmm. And I think my generation, you could still find those underground bars and places that would still sell you alcohol, even though they knew you were underage. So it was very easily accessible. Mm. Yeah. And what made you start at 14? Because, you know, it's not a typical age to pick up a drink. It's not. Mm. For me, so my father was a pastor um, and my mother was also a very devoted Christian. So in my household, I never really saw alcohol. Mm. Uh, the most I ever saw my parents drink was maybe two sips of wine and then, you know, communion wine. That's about it. So a lot of what I learned about alcohol was through TV. Wow. So I only got to saw, I only saw the positive, the cool, sexy things that how alcohol was portrayed in the media. And so as a young teenager, I was super curious and I wanted that. And growing up in Korea as someone who's half Korean, um, identity crisis was it was a difficult time for me because I never felt like I belonged. I wasn't Korean enough. I wasn't American enough. You know, I was half of something. Right. Mm. So it was to me, I really wanted to fit in and alcohol just seemed like, Oh, that's cool. Maybe if I do that, I I'll be considered one of the cool kids. Um, so that's actually how I, it was all my idea. It wasn't like I found myself at a party and I decided to drink. I planned my first drink. I lied to my parents that I was sleeping over at a friend's house. I lied to my boyfriend at the time that I was staying home all weekend. And then I basically asked an older friend like, hey, I want to try drinking. Can you take me out? So it was like, it, was, it wasn't It was a coincidence. It was planned. Yeah. But you said a few things in there, you know, that um, it's pretty sad that first of all, you learned it through TV and, and you're absolutely right. It's so culturally acceptable and encouraged and and you know you always see these beautiful sexy girls but I promise you that if you drink a lot you won't look like that your skin yeah. won't be that glowy and you won't have that body yeah, <laughs> but yeah. that's what they show and they also show that you know sophomores or whatever to have fun there's always drugs or alcohols or mm -hmm. not always but often I should say mm -hmm. that the cool kids and the ones who have a lot of fun are using something um which you know it is sad because um and you also break another um prejudice that we have that when you're surrounded but you have to be surrounded by alcohol to to start having a drinking problem and it was mm. the complete opposite for you. There was absolutely no alcohol in the house. And, you know, your parents were devoted Christians and all of that. So, yeah, it made you turn like completely. Mm -hmm. And how did that first night of drinking go? <laughs> it was probably one of the worst nights of drinking that I ever experienced. Oh. Um, you, As you know, I had never experienced alcohol in my life. I, ne I, was, I never learned how to drink, right? So what I basically ended up doing was I followed the pace of how my friends were drinking and they had, you know, they had, ex ex they had a, what, a little bit of experience, but they had some, and they're also bigger, uh, boys. So I over drank. I still remember exactly how many I had. It was like nine shots of tequila and Jeez. two, two blue cruisers. And you can imagine like, as a young 14 year old girl, I was throwing up everywhere. Mm. Um, it, was, it was really a terrible night. And then I don't remember how we got back to my friend's house. And, you know, once we got there, unfortunately, um, his friend who had joined us, you know, stuck, snuck into my room. And uh, that's the night that my virginity was taken from me. So I was, I was raped. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. That's awful. And it must be also awful that you don't probably don't remember you know exactly or you're thinking I should have done this or should have done that or I shouldn't have been drinking so feeling like you got punished 
there it was it was a really rough time for me because it's not something that's talked about or it wasn't something that was talked about often so it happened when I was 14 and the first time I talked about it was when I was 18 to a therapist so before then like for somebody to experience something so traumatic and then not have anybody to talk about it it was really scary and it wasn't like I didn't have a safe space to bring it up it was a lot of what you talked about where a lot of guilt a lot of shame a lot of self-blaming not knowing what actually happened you know mm, I'm so sorry uh you know and 14 is so young and um and you know you were also talking about identity crisis I've had three teenagers so that's the normal age to be in an identity crisis regardless of what's going on in your life you know uh, everything is so intense at uh, teenage age you when something happens, it's always like under the intensity meter, it's always like <laughs> super intense, yeah. whether it's happy or sad. So, uh, you know, dealing with, with being uh, mixed raised, plus having this happening to you, plus discovering alcohol, um, that probably helped you, pushed you into drinking more. Oh yeah, it was, that was the solution. The solution I had been looking for, even though my first experience was very traumatic, subconsciously, I, I did a good job of suppressing that and forgetting about it. And, you know, every time I drank, I got better. You know, mm -hmm. I knew I knew how much I should be drinking. And then I was only focusing on the positive, which was, oh, I can talk to people easier when I've had alcohol oh, people like me. So I was contributing all of these factors to the fact that I was drinking and not that, you know, maybe that's just me. Maybe I am a likable person. Yeah. And that's the sad part because when we drink, we are the same person. We just lose our inhibitions. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if you're funny, it's because you could be funny sober. <laughs> and if you are a daredevil, it's because you could be a daredevil sober. Uh, you know, you don't completely change person. You just let yourself loose, you know, yeah. so it's just like whatever. Um, and when did you start realizing, first of all, did your parents ever find out? Uh, they found out when I was older. And by then I didn't really care about getting in trouble because, you know, I'd get yelled at, I'd get punished here and there, but I knew that, oh, oh, if this is the only bad side, only uh, punishment I get, then I guess I can do it again, you know? <laughs> yeah, I'll stay in my room for a week. It's fine. I have tons of things to do. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um. So I'm going to ask you a weird question here, but it just popped to my mind. If you were a parent, how do you think you should have dealt with yourself? Oh, my God. So... My dad had no idea because my dad usually goes to bed at 9 p.m. Um, so for him, I'm not really sure like what he could have done better, like sleep later. I don't know. Um, but for my mom, I think she knew, but she didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. And a part of me really respects that she had the patience to give me that freedom and space to figure things out on my own and learn on my own. But if I was a parent, I if I was a parent, I would talk to my child about alcohol earlier than later. And unfortunately, my parents aren't drinkers. So it, it's it's not a topic that's easy for them to talk about because they they don't have the knowledge about, you know, they, they can probably guess and see they do their research. But in their minds, alcohol wasn't there in their life. So they probably just assumed it wouldn't be in mine. Mm -hmm. But the number one thing I, I will do when I have children is talk about alcohol, talk about my story, first of all, um, talk about what alcohol can do to your life, what it looks like, what it might feel like, and other drugs as well. Yes, well, that's the best we can do as parents is talk about it and be open about it. But, you know, there's also like teenagers, we all think we as if I was one, but 
I remember clearly being there were so invincible and it's not because you didn't work for you that it's not gonna like I'm not gonna mess up like you did <laughs> that's the answer I got a few times like <laughs> you messed up but because you didn't do it smartly I'm not gonna mess up but yeah I mean as parents you know there's so much you can do because I think that you have an addictive personality and it's something that you hadn't realized before. And then when alcohol entered your life, well, you know, it showed up and it's something difficult to deal with, especially when you don't understand addiction. Mm -hmm. When did you start realizing that, you know, I have a problem? And I'm pretty sure it didn't come like in a snap. It's over time, but. Yeah, it was definitely over time, I think. But it took a long time. I honestly don't think I questioned my relationship with alcohol until maybe my mid to late 20s. And the reason for that is because I was always surrounded by heavy drinkers once I started drinking. So it kind of, I was very good at justifying my behavior. Mm. And then when, you know, you hit your mid 20s and late 20s and the, even the heavy drinker friends start calming down a little bit if that makes sense and you're the only one that's left still drinking like you're 20 um so I think that's when I was like oh maybe maybe I have an issue maybe I'm not why can't I grow out of this like everyone else has and you know what that's what you're saying there just makes me wonder do we really grow out of it or there's people who have addictive personalities and some who don't because, you know, we call them the heavy drinkers. Even that, like, we don't recognize really uh, the, the the real term of, like, people who have a drinking problem. We're like, oh, mm-hmm. the heavy drinkers. Um, but I don't think it's normal anyway to party that much, um, you oh, know, if you really have, <laughs> like. not. No, but if you don't definitely have not, yeah. any, any addiction at all. Uh, you won't find it normal to be smashed two, three days a week and be like, oh, well, it's the weekend. Um, because I had those friends and I didn't keep them that long because they were boring for me. I was just like, and then naturally you don't, you don't revolve around them either. And they don't revolve around you because you're not on the same planet. Mm. But um, So what did you do when you decided, you know, when you decided, I, I should say, when you realized or when you started realizing maybe it's too much? For what, a long time, I ignored it. Hmm. I ignored it. Um, what I, I don't think I did this intentionally, but I started hiding how much I was drinking. And in my mind, I didn't literally hide bottles. It was more if you and I were out to eat dinner we'd have let's say two glasses of wine and then I knew I would wait to go home to drink more instead of asking you like hey let's just order another bottle or something like that so here and there now that I'm sober I can see that's what I was doing back then I didn't realize that's what I was doing Mm. um but then you start then I started noticing okay when I drink with even with other people, how come my hangover is the worst? Mm. And it was really the hangovers that started to get me to a point where I was getting sick and tired of being sick and tired. And when it finally started affecting my personal relationships and professional growth, that's when I said to myself, okay, I, something needs to change. Mm -hmm. And the first, the first thing I did was I went on Google and I looked up, the only thing I knew was AA and this was during the pandemic. So the first thing I did went on Google, looked up AA meetings and I would join on zoom. I would keep my camera off, microphone off. And I remember like laying in my bed, hungover, listening to these calls and stories and just crying. Mm. but I still went out drinking that night so that happened for a little bit and then when I finally decided this is enough was actually a a very random day I wasn't 
that hung over. But it, I finally had reached a point where I said, enough is enough. Anna, let's just try 30 days. Let's just try it. Like, what's the worst case scenario? And 30 days led into 10 months. Congratulations. And so what kind of, uh, you know, you just said um, you were in bed, hungover and crying, but you would still go out and drink at night. And I remember so many, many, many days getting up and being like, that's it. That's it. I'm not mm -hmm. doing this to myself anymore. Blah, blah, blah. You know, you get ready, you go to work and the whole day you have this mild headache following you and your stomach feels funny. And then I'm like, so done doing this. And then the first thing I would do coming home is open a bottle of wine. And it was just to be repeated. And I was just like, why am I doing it? Jeez. Um, not while I was doing it. While I was doing it, I understood why. <laughs> but, you know, every <laughs> single time after. Um, but we're good at telling ourselves stories as well. And, you know, finding an excuse for that one. But it has to become a decision. You know, whether you take the decision to stop for 30 days or for forever, it has to be a decision. Because, um, and I've heard that so often, like, if you don't want help, no one can help you. You know, I've got so many messages from people saying, I don't know, like, my brother drinks too much, my husband drinks too much, my sisters, my friend, what do you think I should do? And unfortunately, the answer is nothing. There's nothing you can do. The person has to decide. So when you made that decision, what was your, like, what helped you? What was your, okay, I wanted to say crutch, but it's not really a crutch. What was your tools? So I want to say something just because you brought that up about other people being like, you, yeah, you need absolutely. to stop and it absolutely not affecting you. Um, my husband was that person for me. I was the type of drinker where, like I said, I was hiding and I was drinking more at home. So not a lot of, almost nobody knew that my relationship with alcohol was toxic, except for my husband, because he was there for the drinking and the hangovers and all of that. And I distinctly remember moments where I would be pouring myself another glass at home and he'd say something like, babe, you know, don't you think you should stop? Like you've had enough. And I remember telling him, the more you say things like that, the more I want to drink. So stop saying anything. And it's so, I feel so much guilt and shame when I think about the way I reacted and treated my husband at the time, because he's just trying to help, right? But it's so true that the only way I believe you can quit an addictive substance is for you to decide for yourself. And for me, the first, so the, the Zoom AA calls, that's how I started, but I didn't really stick around. And I remember getting ads on my Instagram for this app. And it was an app that said, uh, less wine looks good on you or something like that. And basically the message was, we're going to help you cut back on drinking. And to me, that sounded like an attractive option because I don't want to quit, um, but I want to um, live a better life, li live a more fulfilling life. So I downloaded that and I was on it for two months and it gives daily prompts, journaling, meditating, everything like that. And you have to track every single drink you have. Um, so it helps you actually see if you're cutting back. And I, that's when I tried to moderate is when I realized I can't the only answer I have left now is to quit. So for two months, when I realized moderation is not working, I can't, I literally cannot cut back is the moment I said, okay, you know what? Let me just not drink for 30 days. And that app is, a it's wonderfully made because you can switch over to an abstinence track. So I switched over and the biggest tool for me that really kept me accountable was the community they have. What and is that app? It's called Reframe. Okay. It's the Reframe app. 
Um, I'm still on it. I'm actually speaking as a speaker uh, next Friday, which is crazy because I started off as like uh, just an app user. And now they've invited me to speak at one of their uh, sharings. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, but, you know, first of all, it shows that you came a long way. It shows also that when you decided to become sober, you committed to it. Because some people will stop drinking for 10 years and be dry drunks and not. Um, and that's why you're in the book, because you really did the 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 mental work as well. And, you know, you became sober emotionally as you became sober physically. Um, but I want to go back to the um, moderation. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people talk about that. And I, I was talking with a friend today about, you know, when you don't understand something, it's hard um it's hard to understand someone so someone will tell you like me for years my husband was telling me well years months I should say I would say I have a drinking problem and he would say no you don't just slow down a bit and I was just like well I can't and he was just like it's easy just slow down just stop after your second glass you put know? it down <laughs> yeah exactly put the glass down leave the bottle and I tried that so often to go to bed with a bottle of wine on the counter that I would close properly and you know and I had a hard time sleeping because this bottle was bugging me even if I was not consciously thinking about it like I would find a reason to get up and then I would hmm. be up in the middle of the night and I would be like I am not doing this. I am not drinking in the middle of the night. I'm not that bad. So I would go back up and not touch it. But the fact is, I think that when you're normal <laughs> or when you don't have a, an addiction, you don't think about these things. Like I don't, the coffee is not calling me, you know, when I'm in bed saying like, get up, get up. I'm downstairs. Mm -hmm. No, uh, And I think that that's one place where moderation doesn't work when it's an addiction. Maybe it can work if uh, if it's just because you're drinking too much and you want to lose weight or be healthier. Um, but regardless, if you're drinking too much, there's most likely a problem. Uh, so talk about that a little moderation. Like how can people, because you know the, the app better than I do, and I've never consciously tried moderation. Mm -hmm. so you want me to talk about what it looked like when I was trying yeah and when do when can someone realize like moderation it's not working um so for me I had my own like plan and the plan was the first week I'm going to drink normally as much as I want I'm just going to count because the justification was I need a starting point if I want to cut back. So I went, I had, I had a too much, too much alcohol that week. And then from then on, I said, okay, now that I have a baseline, let's try drinking instead of four glasses of whiskey, let's do three every day. And when I tried that, by the time I finished the third, I was like, I was a different person. I was like, screw it. A fourth one's not going to hurt. I'll start tomorrow. And then, so that made me realize, okay, that didn't work. Let me try instead of drinking seven days this week, I'll drink six days. And then the week after that, I'll do five, then four, then three. And by the time I got to four times a week, it, it wouldn't go down. Hmm. And so it was when, when you, when you realize you make these rules, for yourself when it comes to drinking and you can't keep up with them you keep breaking them that just it's very obvious that moderation is not working and it still amazes me because there were people on the app that succeeded in moderation so I'm not saying just because you try to moderate you have a problem but if you try to moderate and you can't then most likely abstinence is going to be your solution yeah and I think that you know deep down inside we know 
what category we fall in or we'll discover it eventually. So you don't need someone to tell you, but no. inside of you, if it doesn't work for me, it's when your life becomes unmanageable. Mm -hmm. you know and I I never missed deadlines I never missed the meetings I never missed anything important I've I was there for all of my kids things but I was always in a rat race and the anxiety that came with it was just crazy you know which was like the good uh saying I see that on Facebook often like oh um my mom it's my mom time and you see a glass of wine and it was completely acceptable that I would put the kids down and finally have my glass of wine and you know I've moderated for years too of only drinking on the weekends but men when the weekend would arrive <laughs> that was like I was making up for the the other days so and and if you're able to moderate this way but you don't control yourself while drinking you still have a problem because I'm a very strong willed power person. So I can say I'm only going to drink on Fridays and Saturdays and I can be disciplined enough to do that. But it does not mean that I know how to drink when I drink. And it does not mean that I don't have a problem. It just means that I can control, you know, to which day I'm going to drink. So mm -hmm. don't think, and I, that's a point that I want to make because don't think that's why there's people who are called like, weekend alcoholics it's they, they they're able to do their five days a week with nothing um and how much different is your life now than from 10 months ago oh where do I start um it's day and night the biggest difference which kind of trickles into all areas of my life is my mental health uh, when I was drinking I my anxiety was unmanageable. Uh, my depression was, it, it was really hard to deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. And I just didn't have a purpose and I didn't know what the purpose in life was. It wasn't exciting to wake up every day. It was the worst part of the day was waking up because I was hungover and it was just another day and it's like what am I going to do to make the time pass faster yeah so it can oh. be an acceptable time to drink exactly <laughs> um and then now that I don't drink I still have anxiety that doesn't just go away magically unfortunately but it's so man it's so much more manageable I'll still have I call them depression days where I just lay in bed, I don't want to give get up. I still have those, but it's rare. And because my mental health is so much better, I'm able to focus on growing as a person. I feel like my life started when I stopped drinking. I have hobbies. I can focus on being present in my relationships with my husband or my family. Uh, I am such a good worker. <laughs> I like to have an employee that's never hung over is probably I I it should be put on resumes. <laughs> yeah, it's just illegal to ask though. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> yes, no, but I get what you're saying and congratulations by the way cuz you're still in your first year and your body is still adjusting and you know your dopamine levels, your natural dopamine mm -hmm. levels and all of that are still all adjusting and I find you so courageous that while you're in it, you're able to talk about it and share with people because usually we wait to see, you know, I'm going to wait that it's that many years. So I have something to say. I'm, I'm I, like when we feel like we're secure and by the way, we're never secure. You can relapse after a month, 10 years, 30 years. I know people who relapsed after 20 years. So it's like, we're never, um, it's we don't get cured from addiction we learn to manage it and live with it and you know stay clean mm -hmm. um, but what do you do like on those days that you are in your depression days so what I do now yeah what you mean what I do now right yes exactly what do you do okay. now like how do you get to yourself because I'm sure they don't they're not as long as they used to be they're not for sure. And now I actually try on those days versus before I just accept it. I'd let it consume me, you know? 
Hmm. Uh, but the first thing that I really try to do, and this having a dog is great for this, but just go outside, go on like a 10 minute walk. And the what even if the weather is bad for me personally, that completely changes my mood. And knowing myself, I know that I'm the type of person where getting started is the hardest part. But once I make a little bit of progress, I kind of get on this flow. So I try to do something small, like put the laundry in the laundry machine, just start something. Mm -hmm. And that is such, I'm so happy for you that you realize that, like, first of all, at your young age and so early in your sobriety too, that, you know, the big difference now is that you try because I feel like, um, for me anyway, that was the saddest part. I wasn't trying for myself anymore. I was extremely productive and, um, you know, very, very functional, but for my kids, for my job, for my dogs, for my whatever, never for me, if it was for me, I would stay in bed, period. There was nothing that would make, like I wasn't even trying. And that's a bit what we were talking about before, because today we're talking about suicide awareness as well. And, you know, you were saying, well, I never, you were not officially suicidal, but did it cross your mind? So it never crossed my mind to the point where it was like, I want to die. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z in order to end my life. It didn't get to that point, but it was just to give you an example. I would wake up one morning, super hungover, and I'd feel like, wow, this is, I feel like I'm going to die. You know, maybe not, that's not the worst thing. So I was definitely having some suicidal ideations. I didn't have a purpose in life. Like every time I would see my husband, I would think I feel so bad that he chose to marry someone like me. He deserves so much, so much more. I wish, you know, I had a fear that he might leave me, but another part of me was like, he should leave me. That's heartbreaking to hear. And I'm happy that you're, and you know what? I can relate so much to what you're saying because we look at people around us and we feel bad for them to be around us. And that's like, you know, maybe it's not active suicidal thoughts, but it's there. It's in your subconscious that you shouldn't even be there. You know, yeah. if you would not be there, they would be better off, um, you know, and that's sad. And what do you think about like giving yourself all this alcohol that probably way more than your body could actually handle Do you Mm -hmm. think that it's, it's a way of killing ourselves slowly, but surely. I I had conscious thoughts where I was like, this, like, I could feel that my body was just deteriorating. Like if I keep this up, I will die. But I kept it up knowing that. What, why do you think that even if we know what the outcome is, we don't stop? I think that's what addiction is, right? We know, we know our mind has alcohol causes seven different cancers, you know, X, Y, and Z, all these facts that tell us don't drink alcohol, but we still drink because we're addicted. Hmm. That's so right. So Anna, it's such a pleasure to have you on and, um, you know, it's a hard subject, but I'm glad that you're here because you're showing also like what's on the other side. You're showing that, and that's why I wanted to bring you on, like you're young, gorgeous, and now you're thriving and you are actually happy, but it's to show that there is light at the end of the tunnel. And I've, when I've heard this expression before, I was just like, would you just leave me alone? With your <laughs> stupid <laughs> expressions. <laughs> Did anyone ever tell you that while you were in it? Not related to addiction, thankfully. I think I would have rolled my eyes so hard. (laughs) No, yeah, exactly. Because you're like, no, dude, you don't know how deep my tunnel is right now. There is no light. 
but so I'm I'm sorry to say that to people, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. And you know, it's just you need to find someone who will guide you and help you or tools to help you find it. But there is, and there is a beautiful life after addiction. And there is a beautiful life after suicidal thoughts. Um, and I did not have them, you know, consciously or actively, but she did leave a life that was destroying her so and i hope that that's one of the things that you get from this podcast today um you know when you're in it you don't realize it's almost like there's no possibility that there's something better did you ever feel this way well i thought it was impossible for me to stop drinking so it was just darkness when i tried to imagine that future Mm. yes so there is clarity and light after Anna what would you leave people with this one thing that is important I think what I want to share is that you know if you feel like you're addicted to alcohol it's okay alcohol is an addictive substance you're not weird or not normal for being addicted you know many of us are unfortunately and the other thing I want to share is that you are not alone there's people like me there's neighbors there's family members there's people all around you um, that can relate to you and also want to help you so I definitely take advantage of find a community that you feel like you really resonate with and belong to. And once you find that community and you get help from them, then it's your turn to start helping other people. And for me, helping others has been the greatest tool to stay sober. You're right, surrounding yourself. That's very well said. Thank you so much. And if you want to read Anna's full story, uh, you can get the book, That Party Is Over. Uh, Anna, if people want to follow you on Instagram is? It's at Sober Korean. I love that. And uh, if you want to uh, follow Anna, just do. If you want to, if you have any questions or suggestions, please email me info at simplycaroline.com. Thank you all for being here. And Anna, thank you so much for sharing with us today. Thank you, Caroline.